to NASA's Viper Moon Rover Robot Build Watch Party. My name is Lara Strife, and we're taking you back behind the scenes for an exclusive live look as we build NASA's first robotic moon rover. And I'm your co-host, Erica Hengaski, and we're coming to you live from NASA's Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, California. Today, we have Viper experts that will be talking more about the mission and, of course, answering your questions from the chat. We're going to let them introduce themselves, so why don't you tell us your name and what you do for the Viper mission, and Terry, we can start with you. Sure. Hi. I'm Terry Fong. Uh, for the past several years, I've been the deputy manager for the rover development for Viper, and uh, my current role is the lead rover driver. Um, in this role, I'm responsible for making Viper move across the moon. Awesome. Hi, uh, my name is Vandana Jha, and uh, I work with the Na NASA Ames. Uh, for the Viper mission, I have been working with the Nervous instrument. The instrument is already integrated to the bottom, uh, the belly of the rover that you see. Um, I have helped in the building and testing of the instrument, and right now, uh, since last year, I'm also training to work in the mission operations. So I'll be working with the payload, uh, one of the five payload operators, and as the instrument goes, looking for water on moon, uh, I will be managing that. Awesome. That's very cool. Um, so what can you tell us about Viper? What does it stand for, and what is it going to be doing on the moon? Oh, sure. So Viper stands for, uh, stands for <laughs> Volatile Investigating Polar uh, Explore Exploration Rover. And uh, so Viper will be looking for basically water and volatiles on moon. It will be also looking for different kind of minerals, like uh, uh, ma majorly we are going to look for water. And that information, once we find where water is, we are going to create a resource map for on the surface of moon to see how that water is distributed, how deep down it is, and that information is going to be used for future astronauts or future missions to know when they land because you know water is very important for uh, human sustainability, so we want to use that information and find where it is basically. Absolutely. That sounds like a big task. <laughs> that, that is, yeah. Good and job we, on the acronym. That's always something that makes me a little nervous. <laughs> and we know that Viper is going to a lunar south pole, um, and specifically Mons Mouton. Why um, is it landing there specifically? Well, so um, we had to take a look at a number of different factors in selecting a site for where Viper um, is eventually going to be exploring on the lunar surface. Mm -hmm. Part of it has to do with places that are accessible to the rover. Uh, we can't go everywhere as much as we would like to. There are some places we can more easily get to. We also want to try to optimize for places where uh, we can actually detect volatiles. And in particular, we're targeting areas that are called permanently shadowed regions, or PSRs. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, we have to choose places where not just where the rover can drive, but where a lander can get to. So you take all these different factors together, you figure out you know, where there's light, where there's shadow, how long is there going to be darkness, what's the elevation, what's the topography, put it all together, do a lot of number crunching, and you end up with, we should go there. Yeah, and to add to what he said, uh, so like we know, Viper is a solar powered rover, so we want to go where we have abundance of sunlight, mm -hmm. and also we want to have, the other thing is that we will be getting real time data for this mission, so that's one of the big factors. So we want to be able to communicate to Earth all the time, so that was one of the reasons we chose that site, that we have to have all these uh, different parameters checked out. And how does the uh, Viper mission fit into the um, Artemis program? What's the big picture there? Well, I, I think um, if you look at Artemis as a whole, you know, the part of the long-term goal for NASA is to be able to, to go back to the moon, um, make use of the moon to then head on to Mars. And so part of what we're really interested in with, with programs like Viper and then uh, eventually also with human missions is how can we make use of the, the moon in a more sustainable manner? You know, can we make use of resources at the moon? Um, you, know, at, you know, water clearly is an important resource. There are other things that we're interested in in, term, in terms of oxygen and perhaps other materials. Right. Um, and then if we can take advantage of those resources and then use the moon as a place to basically develop technology, rehearse, practice missions, and then also use it as a staging ground um, to then go out and explore not just Mars, but the rest of the solar system, it just leads to this ongoing long-term sustainable strategy. Right. And like he said, like we can use the water if 
the water we find in the soil that can be converted, the hydrogen can be converted into rocket fuel. So for long-term NASA goal, uh, like hashtag moon to Mars, uh, we want to go there and we want to have like a moon base uh, for future generations. So, and then use that rocket fuel to launch to other places. And it will be uh, helpful because, you know, we only have to overcome uh, not unlike Earth, like the gravity is one six, so it will be uh, cheaper, more economical, easier to overcome that power and go to dif explore like different places out there. So this is a really exciting step towards some of those goals that you're talking about, those really long-term goals. Right. And we're really excited that we have live views of yes. our rover as it's mm -hmm. being built, so we can check in with it really quickly now um, over at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Um, what are we looking at? Like, what can we see right now, aside from a whole lot of people working on this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, this, this is the, uh, the clean room that we are doing the assembly of the rover. Uh, the rover is about 70% built, although it doesn't really look like a rover right now because what you see are basically the bare bones, the skeleton of the rover. Yeah. Um, you see people that are working around uh, the, the rover. The, the gold structure there is actually the upper frame of the rover. What you can't see um, are the mechanisms below. Uh, we got a little wave out <laughs> Yeah, there. we got a wave. Got a wave. Um, there's a, there are mechanisms below. So that's where the, the actual... A mobility part of the rover is so there is a you know there are four wheels that are independently steered independently driven um, and an adjustable suspension system so unlike your typical car we can adjust uh, for example how high um, how low what angle is the uh, the rover driving as it moves across the surface um, off on the right hand side of the screen you can actually see it's kind of like a silverish whitish uh, kind of it looks like a tr something sitting on a tripod. That's actually the uh, mass that's going to go on top of the rover, um, and then on the outsides of the rover, we will put solar panels uh, on three sides. Um, overall, it's a pretty large vehicle. It's uh, certainly the size of a actually fairly large golf cart if you want to think of it that way. It's about eight feet tall. Um, weighs um, oh, a thousand pounds. Uh, a bit more than a thousand pounds. Yeah, more it like definitely looks a lot bigger there than it does on this little on scale table. model that we have in front of us, but that's... <laughs> I always feel like, think about it as like a bug, like a uh, v VW, VW bug. bug. That's Not like I... a small bug, like a big bug. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Got it. And we um, know that um, a lot of the hardware has been turning on, including the science instruments. Can you tell us a little bit about that process and what um, the instruments are? Oh, sure, yeah. So we have a suite of uh, spectrometers on board. So I will start with uh, Nervous, obviously, because I work for Nervous. <laughs> I've yeah. been working for Nervous last four and a half years. So Nervous uh, is the short for Near Infrared Volatile Spectrometer System. Uh, Nervous is able to tell the nature of uh, hydrogen in the lunar soil, which will already be detected by the NSS instrument. So it can tell if that hydrogen is uh, in what form it is, if it's in the form of a water molecule, or if it's a hydroxyl, a close molecular cousin of water, or mm -hmm. it's just hydrogen atom. Mm -hmm. Now, in any of this form, uh, we, we are able to like change it and make like ro rocket fuel out of this, uh, which is okay. important. So that's one job it does. Then Nervous has spectrometers on board, and those spectrometers can tell the difference between volatiles and water ice, and it can also uh, detect different minerals in the lunar soil. Like for example, we have a, if we have frozen carbon dioxide or ammonia or methane. And then um, two more things Nervous has is two more important tools. It has a camera module, so AIM imaging module. It has like different LEDs. It gives you the composition of lunar soil in very fine resolution. And then the last part it does is it has a, cali a long wave calibration sensor. Mm -hmm. And what it gives you is the temperature of the lunar soil. So as the, as the drill uh, uh, drills the soil, digs up the soil and brings it up, it's able to tell uh, what's the temperature. Looking at that uh, cutting pile, it's able to tell how much is the temperature of that soil. So that's one instrument, and that's, that's at the belly <laughs> of the rover. <laughs> yeah, so Nervous, is, uh, Nervous has like, it's one thing with three, uh, three it takes care of three mm -hmm. different big mission goals. Right. Um, okay, and then we have a Trident drill, which is, uh, we work very close to the Trident people when we are doing the simulations. Right. Because they operate the drill, and same time we, we turn on our instrument to look at the drill pile while it's doing it. 
So Trident, let me see if I remember the acronym. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's okay if you don't. Yeah. It's okay if you don't. Um, um, it's, it's, the, it's the regulate and ice drill for uh, TRI, drill for, uh, I think, new terrain, for exploring new, new terrain. That's there, right. you oh, there you go. <laughs> so <laughs> the I Trident is a very, the drill is a percussive drill. So it, it does the spiral as well as it can kind of hammer. Mm -hmm. So these, these areas on moon, they have, uh, you have to remember that we are going to these permanently shadowed regions, the craters. They have not seen sunlight in like two billion years. So they are very, very hard. Mm. So it will be helpful if it hammers, that makes it like energy efficient, precision. And the drill bit also, at the bottom of the drill bit, like we have a temperature sensor, so that is also able to tell you the temperature of this lunar soil uh, up to like one meter, mm -hmm. or three foot is where the drill goes all the way. And uh, what else it, it does is like, uh, so um, that's the drill for you. And then the next instrument, uh, NSS the neutron spectrometer mm -hmm. system. That's also based at uh, NASA Ames. So the NERVUS and the NSS, they have been built here at NASA Ames. Very cool. And uh, an NSS, what it does is it tells you the, uh, it measures the change in density of hydrogen. And where there is hydrogen, it's like directly indicative of uh, if, we, if we have water or not. Mm. And uh, it measures these uh, uh, particles, tiny particles called neutrons. So these neutrons are always emanating from the surface of moon. And for example, if it hits uh, something same size like hydrogen, it's gonna lose uh, energy. And this lo loss of energy will be detected by uh, NSS and it will say, okay, fine, we find water there. And mm -hmm. then, you know, the nervous will be able to dig more and uh, likewise. So that was three of the instruments, and the last, uh, not the least, is M Solo. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that is also a mass spectrometer, and the, I think it stands for Mass Spectrometer for Observing uh, Lunar Operations. So M Solo, I think it's very important because as soon as, as soon as we do touch down on Moon, it's gonna tell us because it, it it can measure gas, the composition of gases. It can tell you if the gas is coming off from the lander or if it's from the lunar environment, that's a big difference that we need to know mm. if we are doing that or if it's there from the surface. Mm -hmm. um, it also tells us, uh, differentiates between the different isotopes of water. So that uh, kind of like gives you the ability to tell the origin of water. And that's one of the Viper mission uh, big science goals to find out where the moon water was or like how old it is, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So that's uh, M Solo. Uh, it's, uh, it's based on one of these semiconductor technologies. Uh, so they have, uh, this is built at NASA Kennedy, uh, the whole M Solo instrument. So it, uh, it, I think it, they have taken this technology from industry partners and ruggedized it right at Kennedy. And it's, it's used very prevalently in the semiconductor industry mm -hmm. where uh, they use this technology to detect gas leaks and like uh, wow. prevent uh, hardware like uh, malfunction and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Sorry, that was a lot. So. No, I'm so impressed that you had all of those acronyms ready to go. And I, it sounds like all of those instruments are now installed. Yes. I know it is probably a little bit difficult to see some of them here in our clean room shot. Although I think Trident is sticking out at the top. That's the drill, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and the rest of them are sort of underneath the rover, or I think, Terry, you mentioned this is sort of the front facing of the yeah, rover. Yeah, you're looking at the front of the rover, and if, if I could point to this model. Yeah, um, sure. You know, this is the front of the rover. At, this, at the center here, uh, near the top of the frame, um, it's kind of like the nose that you can see on this model here. You can just make this out. There's actually like these two kind of gold cylinders. That's actually the, the NSS mm -hmm. uh, instrument. Um, and on top there, it's, it's in black, a little hard to see against the, the black of the window. That's the, as you were saying, that's the top of the Trident drill stem. Very cool. And so, I mean, since we've been using this model as a comparison, that's obviously what a completed rover looks like. We're more than halfway through our build, if I'm not mistaken. Almost 70%, Almost I think. 70%. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's definitely starting to take the shape, but what are sort of the next pieces that we're expecting to come on? And like, what's the last piece that comes on? Like, what, what's the uh, final component? Do you know? <laughs> I actually, you know, I actually don't know what the very, very last component is. I mean, certainly the wheels um, mm -hmm. go on pretty late. Mm -hmm. um, the, the mass goes on pretty late. 
Um, we even have the option of on the mass itself, um, if we have some issues, for example, with the, the two cameras, the navigation cameras that are on the mass, we can put those on very, very late because okay. they're, they're basically up on the mass. They're, they're not in the sort of center of the rover. I mean, we build the rover in this, in this manner sort of incrementally from the center on out because inside at the core of the robot um, is the area that we refer to as the warm box. Right. It's the place where we put um, all the electronics um, as much as we can, actually. Maybe not all of it, but a lot of electronics, certainly the computer, um, a lot of the power um, conditioning equipment is in there. And that's the area that we try to keep in basically nice, nice and snug. Mm -hmm. um, because one of the big challenges for Viper on the moon is the thermal um, environment. Mm -hmm. um, right. We go from, from very warm to extremely cold. Um, and the sun, because there's no atmosphere and you know, we're operating on top of uh, the lunar soil, the regolith here, we get a, a lot of direct heating when we're in sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a big challenge. I mean, one of the big things that people may not uh, realize about um, you know, rovers on the moon is you spend most of your time worrying about how do you stay warm or how do you stay cold. Okay. Um, and it's not just, oh, let's stay warm, it's warm and cold. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right, so we're building from the inside out, which is why it doesn't look maybe as recognizable as a component, as a final rover, um, because I'm assuming those outer components are some of the last. Yeah, well, the, certainly the, the, the very outside of the rover on three sides are the solar arrays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is an all electric uh, rover. Very um, cool. It's very cool, <laughs> it's very environmentally friendly, yeah. um, which means it drives all of its power um, from sunlight. sunlight. Um, so just like you know, um, at your house, if you might have uh, solar panels on the roof and you get um, sun, I mean, we obviously can only get power when we have sun. Right. So when we drive into permanently shallow regions or if we drive, for example, behind a hill um, that blocks the sunlight, uh, we're not going to generate power. And so inside the rover, there's also um, a set of batteries that we use to store um, mm -hmm. electrical power and it allows us to operate for some period of time. We can't do it indefinitely, but we can certainly operate uh, for several hours uh, in, even in pure darkness. Big task. <laughs> well, we have a lot of questions coming in from our viewers, and we'll get to those in a few seconds. Um, if you have you have just joined us um, here in the live stream, make sure to put your questions and comments in the chat, and uh, we'll get to those soon. We do have a question specifically about the Trident drill that's come in. Um, mm -hmm. So it's asking, is there a limitation to the length of the drill to be used for sample collection? Would it be any? more beneficial to drill deeper, like one and a half meters or two meters. You want to take that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from what I know, uh, the drill is equipped to go uh, until like a meter, which mm -hmm. is like three foot. That's where we are going to expecting to see most of the resources. Uh, so that's how we have planned it right I now. See. I mean, so it's we are not planning quite to go large already, yes, right? <laughs> we are not yeah. planning to go any more deeper. That's what I know. Awesome. Sarah, we have a question here. Um, what is the expected travel distance for Viper? So Viper's um, mission design uh, requires us to, to drive uh, up to 20 kilometers total mm -hmm. over the duration of the, the mission, which we anticipate will probably be about 100 days or so. Yes. Um, but 100 days is the complete time that the rover's on the surface. It's not actually the complete time that it's going to operate. Mm -hmm. um, operationally, it may only drive for maybe 30 to 40 days out of that 100-day period. Mm -hmm. um, the periods when we don't drive are, are times when we either don't have direct line-of-sight communications from the moon to the Earth, or when the sun is below the horizon and the rover is not able to generate power. Mm -hmm. In those periods of time, it's basically hibernating. It's, trying, it's all shut down, minimal power, just trying to stay warm until the sun comes back up mm. and we can generate more electricity, p electrical power, and then warm up and start up again. Um, but the total end-to-end -end drive that we're designing rover and testing Viper for is about 20 kilometers. Yeah. Wow. Right. All right. <laughs> and, and it's very fast for a rover. Yeah. Like it's, uh, I think it's 0.45 miles per hour. Yeah. Like it's, uh, I think it's 0.45 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. And then that's, and then when we are prospecting, uh, it slows down when it has to collect data. It's 0.25 miles per hour that time. So right. it's it's faster than a lot of I believe other Mars rovers where yeah, it it's dri like it 0 0.1 miles is. Yeah, it I drives about I four to five times faster than any yes. of the rovers that we have previously uh, sent wow. to Mars. Mm -hmm. It's still very slow compared to like, <laughs> automobiles. But True, right. Our goal is not to race across the moon. I mean, in, in fact, mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, as a roboticist, uh, I look at this and think, wow, this is, this is a, a wonderful system. But unfortunately, it's, the purpose is not just to put a robot on the moon. The purpose is to put instruments on the moon. The robot happens to be the way that you do that. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Um, I have heard it compared to a race car uh, as a rover, you know, in comparison to other rovers. But you're right, it, comparatively to what we know as a race car, not maybe quite as fast. Um, we got another question from our audience, which is, who are the people we see in that clean room? I don't think we're asking you to name names, <laughs> but um, who gets to go in there? Like, who works on the rover on a regular basis, yeah. hands on? So as we build the robot, um, it depends on what particular activity is, is being done at any given time mm -hmm. as to who will need to be in there. Sometimes right. are, is people that focus on structures, other times people that focus on mechanisms. Today, um, what's going on at this moment right now is, is the installation of uh, what's called MLI, or multi-layer insulation. It's uh, basically this, kind of like those, uh, you know, if you've ever seen those uh, metal metallic sort of blankets you use as an emergency if you're camping, right. um, it helps the rover stay warm by covering right. up surfaces so that we can try to retain heat. Um, one of the people in here, um, I see her every once in a while, you'll recognize her by her very distinctive uh, glasses, <laughs> is Emily McBrien. She's actually also a rover driver. Right. Um, there are actually 10 uh, people on the mission that are designated as rover drivers, um, but they come from all different parts of the, the team. Um, part of our approach here is that the team that builds the robot operates the robot, mm -hmm. uh, because you know the, the most about that. and. Because this robot has so many different kinds of system, different kinds of parts, um, it's important for us to have people uh, who work from on different things. And so that's why Emily, who's the, the lead for the, uh, the MLI installation today, um, also has this dual role of not only building it, but getting to operate it too. Great. Um, I'd love to know more about how Viper will maneuver in the dark. Is there a light source? Yeah, yes. so uh, Viper Sorry. is unique thus far um, in terms of the rovers that NASA has built in that it has headlights. Mm -hmm. um, and not just a pair of headlights, it actually has a set of uh, eight lights that are around the robot. Um, mm -hmm. There are actually two that are on the mast that we can point along with the navigation cameras. Uh, we use this not only in areas where it's purely dark, but also because we're going to uh, a place on the moon, which is very, very far south, um, it's a location where the sun angle is very low. The sun is only a few degrees above the horizon. And what that means is we have shadows that are, are really long. Um, mm. Even the rover shadow can be quite long. And so to see into those shadows, we also use the lights to help mm -hmm. us illuminate the terrain. Right, I think this is the first rover with headlights, if I'm not mistaken. It is the first rover. Right, that's yeah. pretty exciting. That is. So far, it is the only rover with headlights. So, so far, <laughs> maybe this is the new standard. Who knows? I guess we'll find out. Yeah. Yeah, it, it does a first for a lot of things, actually, Viper, like first rover with headlights, first uh, NASA's first mobile robot, mm -hmm. we call, on moon. Um, first uh, biggest payload delivery also uh, for, by Clips, like a commercial partner, so that is kind of also an engineering testing and feat for us, because if, uh, it will uh, pave way for the future generations, you know, to use these commercial partners for this kind of a payload delivery because it's large and heavy. <laughs> so, yeah, so a lot of firsts for Viper. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, so we got another question from our chat. How are we dealing, or how are you planning on dealing with the lunar soil interfering with the wheels? That might be a Terry mm. question since you're driving this thing. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we, we do worry a lot about uh, the soil conditions uh, where, of where we're going on the moon because mm -hmm. uh, no one has been there before. Right. Um, certainly not a planetary rover. Mm -hmm. And so part of the overall design of Viper was to create a mobility system that's very capable. So it's a four-wheel drive system, but as I said, each wheel is independently driven and independently steered, so we can basically turn and spin each wheel independently. Um, and they're all connected to an adjustable suspension system. Mm -hmm. So we can use that uh, to help us maneuver effectively around lots of different kinds of terrain. And one of the things that we have done is that uh, in addition to its normal mode of driving, which is basically turning and driving the wheels, mm -hmm. we've developed uh, what we consider to be al alternate locomotion strategies, which is a fancy way of saying that the robot <laughs> can do things like it can kind of do a s almost a little bit like a breast stroke. It can mm -hmm. kind of swim. swim. Right. It can walk the wheels. Wow. Um, yeah. It can kind of inchworm along. Um, and thus, these different capabilities allow us to handle 
um, almost any kind of circumstance that we can think of, and we've tried basically um, getting the robot stuck in lots <laughs> of different kinds of soils <laughs> and conditions, and it's been pretty successful at getting out of that. Yeah, um, I've seen the test testing, videos, yeah. um, and when it was inch warming, getting yep. out of that, yep. like very thi thin and, and fine soil. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, when it has that kind of soil, it can basically walk like humans, like it can walk like that. <laughs> and also, I saw the testing here at the lunar, um, the uh, rock uh, mm -hmm. the area that we yep. have, and I saw that it also has an angle, it can go 15 degree. So somebody put purposefully like a rock just to show us how cool it is. And <laughs> it, it jumped on it and it went. It was able to maneuver. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I will. I will say that our our objective is not to use all of those kinds of sure. mm -hmm. sure. features all the time. I mean, it's designed to drive uh, in what you would consider a normal fashion. That is, we rotate the wheels and we turn the wheels. Um, if you have to use these alternate capabilities, then it can lead to more wear and tear on the system. And of course, our goal is to be able to make it all the way to the end of, say, 20 kilometers. Right. Um, but it's nice to know that there's the capability there, the possibility that if we need to, then we can drive this in ways that other rovers have not been able to, to operate. Yeah, ready for anything. Yeah, yeah. well, we'll uh, see. <laughs> and I mean, uh, you mentioned, you know, we've never been to this part of the moon before. Uh, Wendan, is this also like a consideration for science instruments? Do we have to take the lunar regolith into account, or is it not really an issue? Um, so, can I get that question again? For the function <laughs> of the science instruments, is the, is the lunar regolith also a challenge, or is it going to be something that we're yeah, I think definitely we have to consider that uh, for uh, the, the regolith, that kind of, because we have not been there, but I think we are prepared uh, to deal with that. Do you also put the test through all these kinds of variable scenarios, different kinds of soil? Yeah, yeah, we have done some testing here uh, at, in the uh, Lunar Regolith Lab. Uh, so we are prepared. I mean, even the rover, like it was tested, I think, for egress testing in uh, NASA Glenn. Right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And back mm -hmm. in 2022, so we have done a lot of uh, testing to to get ourselves prepared majorly. Every part of it, I assume. Right. <laughs> right. It goes through its test. Yeah. <laughs> we have a question here. Can the rover moonwalk? <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? We, as we have we haven't produced a moonwalk video, but that's a great idea. Ooh. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Uh, we also have a question of how long does it take to build this rover? I mean, we mentioned we're kind of 70% through. I think there was a lot of time before the build even started mm -hmm. for planning the design, um, planning out the mission. How would you best answer that question? Uh, well, it's, it's hard to give it an exact um, uh, duration. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it has to do with the fact that as we build, um, we are also being very careful about testing. So mm. it's not that you just build the whole entire uh, rover and then test it. You, yeah. you test it as you build it. So mm -hmm. for example, for the past few weeks, um, we've been incrementally adding in more and more um, you know, components uh, and instruments and electronics to that. And every time you do that, then you have to go through and you basically you know, confirm that you, know, you have good power and data. And if there's a problem, then you may need to basically remove things and figure out what's going on. And so although we have a, a, a plan that says, well, we're going to start here, and we're going to do all these steps, several thousand steps, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's not something that you can easily say, oh, yeah, they'll take exactly you know, four and a half weeks. Um, we've been working on this now for, for several months. But you know, as you said, Laura, I mean, the planning for that has gone on for a couple years now. Yeah, and I mean, we see just wrapping some of that protective material, it takes time. <laughs> so we're being very thorough, it looks like. Yeah, well, in addition to that, you know, one of the things that we are trying to do is we, we document the build process as well. Mm. So right. you'll see occasionally af after, after some materials put on, people will be going in with cameras, they'll be taking documentation shots from various angles here mm -hmm. to help us uh, better understand exactly what has gone on to the rover and how things actually ended up not just as they were designed but how they really were you know as it was built nice. um, there's a question I think this is for you Terry does a Viper does Viper drive itself or is it all <laughs> controls by the control center it's a good question for yeah the so it's yeah well it's it's, a, it's, it's a, what I'm going to spend most of my time doing once Viper gets <laughs> to the surface um, so Viper has um, an ability to to know exactly where it is on the moon. Mm -hmm. um, it has a system for basically estimating its position. Mm -hmm. uh, we operate the rover generally by giving it a waypoint to drive to. That is a location 
that we say we want you to go from point A where the rover is to point B. Mm -hmm. And the rover is smart enough to be able to understand exactly how to turn and drive to that location. Um, so we don't sit there um, like you would do with an RC car and basically <laughs> real-time joystick it. Yeah. We basically give it a, a position-based command where it will drive from point to point. Great. Yeah. But you made a good point. It is near real time that we get to see this rover in action when it's on the moon. That is, um, you know, just to go along with the, the list of other firsts, I mean, because this is NASA's first uh, lunar rover mission, it also means that our mission operations design is very different. Mm -hmm. right. um, you know, in terms of uh, real time communications, it's, it's not instantaneous. There's still the round trip communication time between the Earth and the moon, so we'll mm -hmm. send a a command of the rover, it has to go to the moon, to the rover, the rover has to do something, it has to send information back. And there's also, because there are ground stations and buffering and, and actually Earth terrestrial networks, round trip is maybe six to ten seconds. Um, so it's not, you know, immediate, right. um, so but it's good. real time. Almost real. <laughs> but compared, really compared to Mars, which is 20 to 40 minutes, um, it's mm -hmm. round trip, it's, um, it certainly is real time in that yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think when I watch something live, there's usually a little tape delay. Yeah. I was watching the Grammys the other night. Like, you know, I think <laughs> yeah. six seconds, not that at all. Yeah. Um, and then to bring it back to, you mentioned earlier that you've got team members from all different sort of parts of the Viper team that are going to be drivers. Um, how do you kind of prepare for that role that no one's done before? Yeah, we have, um, have started uh, mission operations training. Uh, it actually started last year. We go through a variety of uh, simulation sessions mm -hmm. where we try to simulate different aspects of the mission. Um, and then, of course, we also have practice uh, sessions where we focus on specific aspects of operations. Um, so in terms of like the drive team itself, uh, we have um, specific techniques that we are worrying about. You know, so for example, if you're driving as we refer to it, down sun or up sun. Mm -hmm. um, it's very you know, similar to, in many respects, to thinking about sailing, because you worry about the, where the wind is in, mm -hmm. in sailing. Um, here, uh, for a solar-powered rover that only has solar rays on three sides um, and long cast shadows because of the sun, we worry about where is the sun? Right. And we worry about how do we drive relative to the sun? Um, if you're driving, for example, down sun, you have long cast shadows, which means that you're basically blocking everything that you're about to drive over. And so you have to have strategies to say, well, I want to look and assess the, the terrain before I get there, because when I get there, the body's going to cast a shadow and block the terrain. So it's really fascinating. Um, it's, it's a lot of interesting, uh, I think, uh, training and practice and this uh, mission operations work goes on for a long time. It's not just, hey, we launch True. it and then we'll figure it out. Instead, True. we spend a couple years leading up to the launch uh, working out and practicing operations. Yeah, very cool. I agree. I was very impressed that we started training. It's been like more than a year uh, in this. And NASA Ames, the mission, multi mission operations mm -hmm. center, is based at NASA Ames here. So we were doing like all the instrument operators will come and we will be very serious. Like we are already on moon and we are uh, traversing on moon and looking at moon data. We have this simulation data that we work with. And uh, like the nervous team, they work very closely with the Trident drill because you know uh, we have uh, procedures that we follow where every team does a step. So it's uh, it's useful also going through it, and I understand how useful it is. That that takes care of you know prepares you for all kind of errors that can happen when you actually are on the moon and you don't want to do that. You want it to happen <laughs> right. now. You, yeah, we said we're preparing the rover kind of for anything. We're also preparing, it sounds like, all of our team members for yeah. any okay. scenario um, for a long time. You're getting a and lot then, of training. Uh, <laughs> you know, the way it will work is like the mission operation people are like, we will be going like two weeks around the clock. Mm. So there'll be like three shifts and we'll be going uh, one after another. You could be working during the night. So like it's nice to be trained and aware and like train your mind body for like that kind of <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I mean, you're never trained enough, but you know, but it's good to do the yeah, homework. Yeah, absolutely. Train your friends and family to get used to the schedule. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's been a, a Viper build highlight for you personally? Uh, I I just was uh, thrilled to actually see the the navigation camera uh, not the navigation cameras but some of the cameras get put on. Mm. Um, you know, as a driver uh, for Viper, I'm used to thinking about you know exactly where is the robot in relationship to the world, mm -hmm. and the way you do that is you rely for this mission on cameras. Cameras are really 
um, the sensor that we use for observing the environment and figuring out what's safe, what's not safe, mm -hmm. and where we can go. Um, you know, I think a lot of people probably uh, on, on the stream here are familiar with all the development in self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. They have lots of sensors that work well here on Earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Unfortunately, we can't just take one of those and, and somehow make it work in space mm -hmm. um, because yeah. the environment is radically different. You know, very cold, very harsh, harsh. in terms of radiation, mm -hmm. in terms of dust. So things like uh, laser scanners don't right. work well, especially mm -hmm. if they need to be small and light and low power. Um, and so what we rely on are cameras. So when the cameras started going on, I got excited. Ah, uh, awesome. That's How about exciting. you? What's been a highlight for you? For, uh, I think the whole process for me, it's so impressive because I've been with the nervous instrument. Uh, like I worked in the clean room for four years. So, you know, you are so meticulous. I work with people there, like even small stuff, like just, uh, you know, uh, thread lock and stuff because so you know that everything is so important during the process and we worked on that for four years uh, like taking it to we did the I supported for the environmental like we have at NASA engineering evaluation lab where we take the instrument uh, put it on a wipe table shake it up with like you know flight like frequency to know uh, if it's gonna survive same like put it in a thermal vacuum chamber and see if it goes to very high and low temperature. Mm -hmm. So what impresses me is like there's a whole lot of step that goes into something going to a different planet. And mm -hmm. finally, like an <laughs> after every step, you run these functional tests and then the team members look at it and say, okay, fine, this is what we expect or not, you know. And then now finally it's at like, it's in Houston, it's integrated and our job is still not done. Now we are training for mission operations. That's right. So. So it's, I just have so much respect for all the prior missions, uh, you know, like, uh, like uh, NASA Ames has done a lot of lunar mm -hmm. missions in mm -hmm. the past, you know. Um, the Nervous PI, Tony Corporate, like, you know, he was associated with like Laddie and L Cross, mm -hmm. uh, those missions where the instrument went and like a uh, first time detected that there is water like mm -hmm. in the Laddie, uh, in the L Cross mission. So it's like a step by step thing. So for me, the the big big picture thing is that what I understand is that like anything big needs a lot of small steps mm. yeah and you gotta absolutely. keep going for a long period of time <laughs> for it to actually happen that that really blows my mind like you know nothing like big happens in a day that's my takeaway I would say oh, yeah you know our highlight <laughs> oh. I thought you both were just gonna say you know when the builds complete um, but oh. you're right because that's not the end either it's gonna it's never the it's end got a launch it's, it's a got journey. a land there's, a, a yeah, there's a lot of milestones to come yeah um, unfortunately I know Terry you have to leave us now because you've got other places to be but fortunately Madonna is gonna stay with us and we've got another Viper Vision team member waiting in the wings so in the meantime, we'll cut to just a shot of the clean room where you can see the live views of the rover being worked on by our friends and colleagues at NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Um, and we are coming to you live here from our studio at Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, California, which is the home of Viper Mission Operations. All right, thanks, Terry. Thank you, Terry. Um, if you're not familiar or you are just joining us now, Viper is NASA's first robotic moon rover and it'll be exploring near the lunar south pole for water and other resources. Hello. <laughs> Hello and welcome. <laughs> Thanks for joining the watch party, hon. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> make yourself comfortable. Um, and can we ask you to quickly introduce yourself as well, your name and what you do for the Viper mission? Sure. My name is Hans Thomas, and I am a flight software engineer on the Viper team. And uh, so I mainly deal with the electronics and the computers that run the vehicle and basically make Viper Viper. Very cool. And you're one of the drivers, and I understand. I'm, and I also have, I also have driving responsibilities <laughs> as well. A super cool job title. Awesome. <laughs> well, for those that are just joining um, and um, are seeing the Viper clean room, Wandana, can you tell us a recap again of what we're, we're seeing here? Oh, yeah. So uh, right now, uh, we are seeing like the rover uh, is getting, it's, we're, what we are looking, first of all, is the Johnson Space Flight Center. It's in Houston. 
and all these people in the clean room are working on the rover. Maybe you want to add more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what what it, what you see there in the in the picture is uh, an aluminum frame mm -hmm. that's uh, alodized. So so that gold coating you see is a special coating we put on the aluminum. So so I like to think of that as the skeleton of the rover. Mm -hmm. And now what we're doing is we're basically kind of putting what amounts to your skin on the rover. This is this is all an in, a, a large insulating blanket that's going to keep the batteries warm and keep the electronics w warm and keep them cool. Keep them from getting too hot when the sun is uh, beating down on the rover. But before we got to this stage, we had to go through a lot of testing because once we start putting all the all this MLI onto the vehicle, we really don't want to have to take it off. So right. we've gone through a whole set of what we call channelization tests, and these, this is a fancy word for turn every single thing in the rover on and make <laughs> sure it works. And in the case of this rover, that's a lot of circuits. We have um, about 200 or so independent circuits on the vehicle that do everything from run heaters to run instruments to turning on lights and, and radios and things like that. So we have to test each and every circuit and make sure it's behaving correctly. And if we find a problem, we have to go back and, and figure out what we what, what what's not working correctly. Right, and, and this is a familiar scene for you because you've been in that clean room, if I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah, right? I've been in that clean room. I've been in the, 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 the garb that you see there. Yeah, um, what's that experience like? Um, it's, uh, first of all, it's really loud in a clean room because mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of uh, clean air that's moving around in, inside there. And uh, second of all, the, the garments that you're wearing are, uh, they're not the most stylish thing in the world, but they're also very, <laughs> very warm. You, you'd be right. surprised how okay. warm those, those jackets are. And because we control the humidity, it's, um, uh, you actually can get quite dehydrated working in there. So, you know, sort of every every three or four hours, we have to stop and take a break and go outside. Right. And then the uh, other other big thing we always worry about when we're working on spacecraft is what we call electrostatic discharge. Right. Um, and so you'll see everybody that's around the rover has has a little gray cord that's running back to a box on the wall or on a frame, and that. That, gr that keeps us grounded so that we can't walk up and sort of zap the robot and damage something. So, um, so it's, it's kind of a choreographed process. We have a set of procedures. We're, we're not just sort of in there, you know, doing things. We have some pretty specific roles and, and sequences of work to try to, try to get this thing assembled. Because one of the things you got to appreciate is that y you can't reach in and touch different parts of the vehicle after you've put the MLI on or after you've closed a certain box out. So, so we have a pretty prescribed order of, of operations to make sure that, that we don't get something fully assembled and then realize, oh, okay, well now we have to go back in and, mm. and, and try, to, try to get at the, you know, that screw or that connector or that box. One of the main questions that we get on social media is like, how big is Viper? How much does it weigh? Um, weighs a little bit more than a thousand pounds in air on Earth. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's going to weigh less on once we're on the Moon, and and it's the size of the the horizontal footprint is about the size of a of a golf cart right. or, or a VW Bug. It stands very tall though. Um, the the uh, rover itself, without the mast mm -hmm. that that you see here, and without Trident, is uh, about five and a half feet in 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 the air, but by the time you get the mast and the antennas that are on the mast, it's almost up at eight and a half eight, feet. Yeah. So it's a, so it's a pretty tall system. Definitely is. Um, it's very impressive to look at, and there's a ton of people working on it. Um, but we also want to get back to our audience questions. So if you do have a question for our experts, this is your chance to put them in the chat. We've got a lot of really good ones uh, lined up. Erica, do you have yeah. one you want to? Um, so one, Donna, maybe this one's for you. Um, how are they detecting the water? Oh, so um, there are spectrometers on that. So first of all, um, we want to find out like 
that for example the NSS instrument is looking at the hydrogen density and it's the direct indicator of like where there is hydrogen it indicates that we have water ice that's one way to look at it. Uh, similarly, uh, the nervous instrument can also detect water. It has the ability to detect if it's water ice mm -hmm. or if it's hydroxyl. Uh, and so those are the two different instruments that can look, look at uh, different ca characteristics and then find, say that, okay, we have water ice there. Mm, got it. Um, this might be a question for you, Hans, because it has to do with navigating and, and driving. How much autonomy does the rover have for navigating when it's out of communication? So um, let me answer the second part of that question <laughs> That's a first, and then I'll get to the first part. So in uh, the rover, as our operations are structured, the rover doesn't operate without direct communications from Earth. So when when we can't communicate with it for, for and there are various um, periods in the mission where we do have communications blackouts, we put the rover into what's called hibernation. So it can actually send a command to the computer that tells it to put all of the major power consuming electronics to sleep mm. and just run what we call survival heaters yeah. and just sit there and, uh, and try to stay warm and not, not use up too much power. In terms of autonomy, the, the rover has the ability, it has what's called a uh, inertial measurement unit and uh, th this is basically a set of gyroscopes and accelerometers that help keep the vehicle driving in a straight line. And because there's no magnetic field on the moon, so we can't, we can't really use compasses on the moon. So the rover can use that, that, that inertial measurement unit and it also has, uh, it's kind of cool actually, it has what are called uh, force sensors or load cells on its wheels so it can measure how much force each wheel is pushing onto the ground. So it can sort of drive in a straight line, it can keep its wheels evenly uh, pushing on the ground in case you hit a bump so that you don't lift a wheel off the ground. And it can basically drive a certain amount of distance based on the, 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 wheel, the wheels turning, what we call the odometry. It, it has limits. That, that are imposed in software so it won't do something like high center itself or try to flip itself over. Okay, good. <laughs> but that's really about the, the level of autonomy. So it's, um, it's, it's smarter than a radio controlled car because um, I know my, my six year old can flip his radio controlled cars <laughs> over really easily. So it's smarter than a radio controlled car but it's, it doesn't have the same level of autonomy as a Mars mission does where where you really need it because you only get to talk to the system a couple of times a day. So, so you know, by keeping the level of autonomy uh, lower, we can, we, can, we can reduce the complexity, especially mm. of the software, and, and build the system cheaper. But, um, but it still has to be smart enough that it can drive, you know, about five meters or so by itself at a time. Wow. Very cool. Awesome. Um, here we have a comment and question. I'm watching this with my seven-year-old daughter, Adele. She's super excited that Aww. her name is going to the moon. So she Ooh. signed up yes. <laughs> to send her name uh, to the moon with Viper. And Adele's question is, how many people are working on Viper and what types of job roles? Oh, wow. <laughs> so a lot, a yeah. ton. Because, <laughs> um, you know, they're like four, uh, there's NASA Johnson has a team of people you know, working on the rover. Mm -hmm. There is Kennedy, where the, uh, they're working on the M Solo, and then we have NASA Ames, where we are taking care of you know uh, the NSS instrument and the Nervous, and also the NavCam. Mm -hmm. And then, if we want to include our industry partners, so Nervous has Brimrose, and then we have the Trident Drill, which is like Honeybee, Altadena. So it depends on how many you want to include, and I would like to include everybody yeah. who has a contribution. <laughs> So, so it's just a lot. It's just, a lot. <laughs> I don't know, like a many, many, <laughs> a ton of people. Yeah, and it sounds like all kinds of different roles too. And all kind of different roles. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. It's it's very diverse. You can you don't have to essentially like just be in science even mm -hmm. or like you know engineer. There's other kind of roles that you can do, like for like you know those MLI, MLI blankets and those kind of stuff. They they need to be made. Absolutely. And there are people who are working on those, and that's very delicate work. So yeah, and the people that, especially you know, the MLI uh, fabricators and installers are 
are an, an interesting, it's an interesting group to work with because they're, they're very, they're, it's like working with the most meticulous tailor that, that you've ever, <laughs> that you've ever dealt with, but, yeah. it, but there's still a lot of um, what I would call craftsmanship to, right, right. to, to building, you know, building the uh, MLI. Um, you know, we have machinists and, and, and uh, you know, fabricators that can work with all these different materials that we have to build the uh, vehicle out of. Um, we have, uh, of course, a lot of engineers and, and, and folks like that that work on all the different, different aspects of it, uh, of the system. But it, it, you know, it's it's a very very diverse crowd. Um, just looking at the at the people on the floor in there, and, and some of the folks that, that that I know personally, we have some 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 of the folks that are in on the floor there are what we call quality engineers. So right. so so it's not so much like they, they they're not like a programmer or a, a circuit board designer, but but they they understand the the engineering process. And their job is to basically sit there and make sure that we do our jobs properly, that we're following right. our procedures, and and you know they're very experienced um, engineers that can a, a lot of times they spot problems as we're building it and 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 mm -hmm. keep us you know on track, keep yeah. us from making making mistakes. So um, you know it's 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 such a such a diverse you know set of talent um, okay. that that we that we interact with. Even the folks who work with at Glenn Research Center that build what I like to call the world's coolest sandbox, right. which is <laughs> Slope Lab, yeah. um, are you know an amazing bunch of you know again hydraulic engineers and 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 fabricators that that built this massive sandbox that we can tilt up mm -hmm. and down and practice driving in. Yeah, we were just talking that we did the egress testing for uh, right. our rover there, like uh, May 2022. Right, right. So yeah. Well, I mean, that brings me to this next question, which is how far away are we from getting this thing on a shaker table and a full test of all features? It sounds like some features have already been tested. Some are maybe currently being tested. What can you say about that? So uh, the process that we go through when we're building the rover is we, we have a set of components or boxes. We have a control computer. We have instruments like Nervous, and Solo. Trident, and, and before these instruments are delivered into the program, each one of these subsystems goes through its own uh, thermal vacuum mm -hmm. testing to, to, to test that it operates across its full temperature range. It goes through its own vibration uh, testing so that, so that we can catch those problems before we bolt the, bolt the entire system together. Um, we will go into vibration and TVAC hopefully this summer. Um, like in the May Juneish time frame, assuming we don't don't hit any uh, major snags as we're building it, so we'll go through system level vibration, and then we'll go into uh, TVAC uh, thermal thermal vacuum testing, and uh, the thermal vac testing is actually going to be kind of exciting because if anybody watched the movie Armageddon, where <laughs> you know with Bruce Willis, sure and, thing, yeah, yeah uh, uh, where they where they were doing their testing in the, in this big thermal vacuum chamber in the movie, that's the chamber we're going to be going into. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh. So, cool. um, so yeah, we're going in, we're going into the historic chamber too. And, uh, and, and this will be, you know, really exciting for us. It'll be really exciting for the, okay. for the team at JSC. And, uh, and once we go into TVAC, we'll conduct a whole sequence of operations, basically simulating deployments of the drill, taking pictures, articulating, the uh, pans and tilts and the high gain array and making sure this whole thing can work across that that full lunar temperature range. Can't wait to see that. Yeah. Those tests. That'll be very exciting. Is yeah. that the major testing that occurs before it goes to the moon? Because we can't drive the final flight unit rover on Earth. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the limitations when we build these things for these environments. Uh, and you know, we take advantage of the fact that 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 the moon has much lower gravity, but mm -hmm. that means we can't drive it here on Earth. We do have a a, a, a test bed vehicle that we use here on Earth. We right. call it the the McGrew or the mm -hmm. the uh, the the Moon Gravity Reference Unit that we that we test uh, deployments and uh, operations with. But yeah, this this instrument this this system we can't really drive it. Got it. 
So um, after that, after we go through that TVAC, we'll, we'll ship it to Pittsburgh, where we're working with our CLIPS partner, Astrobotic, okay. and then we'll work on integrating it to the, uh, the to the lander. Yeah. And Exciting. once we get it on <laughs> Griffin, then, yeah, then we're starting to get real. Yeah. So. Um, we have one question for you, actually, Wendana. Sure. Um, you're very knowledgeable and an inspiration for many women. Ah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I wonder how a NASA scientist like you spends downtime to keep being energetic, creative, and productive and inspired. Oh, <laughs> my God. So, like, what I do other than my work here, is that what they act like? I mean, I have two dogs, and I love them <laughs> to death. <laughs> so every day when I'm done with work, that's like I look forward to really going home and going on a long walk with them. Mm -hmm. That's uh, even on weekends. And fortunately, we are in the Bay Area. There's like so many hikes. Mm -hmm. Not like right now when it's raining outside and it's freezing. <laughs> but <laughs> if it's a sunny weekend, then I take them out. And uh, I like reading. I mean, I that's one of my I like reading. Sometimes I just. Mm -hmm. Cook myself a healthy meal to just feel better. So a bunch of stuff. I like yoga. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Hans? Oh, um, you know my my big my my big go-to is uh, I drive home from work and I open up the door and uh, my kids come screaming at me and my dog comes screaming at me and the wow. cat starts screeching and <laughs> my wife's asking me where's dinner and get cooking and you know that that's really my my uh, the, my Downtime. salvation yeah. that's what keeps, <laughs> keeps me happy um, keeps you busy it sounds like yeah <laughs> now, I'm, I'm, I'm the thing that always puts a smile on my face is when I've got all four burners in the kitchen going and mm. I'm throwing throwing meals in and <laughs> trying to do math homework at the same time. It's awesome. a good, good time. Yeah, very cool. Um, so we got a question that is uh, about what happens to Viper sort of at the end of its mission. Um, what will that look like? Is that going to be sort of a, a hard stop? I was seeing shaking of the head. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a hard stop. We will keep measurements as long as it goes. So it's more like on the battery when it quits on us. Because I know there is a lot of Mars rovers, which like they were planned for a shorter period, but they still keep going. Right. So mm -hmm. we will use, we will take as much data as we can, because we are scientists here and we want to know mm -hmm. uh, all the effort that we are putting on. We are not going like, to just let it go just because it's a 100 day like you know deadline. We'll, we'll keep working as long as it, it supports the operations. And then, yes, at the end, the battery might quit on us, and then it will stay on moon. Right? <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, <laughs> it, it might wake back up oh, once yeah. the sun comes, comes onto it. But uh, we, like we do that. have, um, we do kind of have a kill switch uh, that we can, we can send a command to it, and it kind of sets the electronics up so that so that the batteries are going to die and that it can't really can't really turn itself back on um, so you do when you build a mission you got to have a disposal plant got to mm. have a way to turn this thing off so that it doesn't interfere with uh, future operations um, it sounds a little bit like we're just going to have to see what happens on yeah. the moon. <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> Take it, it one day at a time. Exactly. It could last a lot well, one exactly. lunar day at a time. One lunar day at a time. <laughs> Baby steps, yep. <laughs> Um, and how does uh, Viper um, how does Viper map the surface of the moon? Um, our, so we map the moon in a cup in a couple of different ways. One one is we we're, we're every time we stop we, we can pan the cameras around. Mm -hmm. um, this this is the uh, set of uh, of cameras and lights that are on the mast, and we can generate a panorama. So that gives us a full three hundred and sixty degree. Mm -hmm view around the robot and we can we can we can build we can merge those panoramas together to get a, a very complete map um, but on the fly as we're driving we can also take measurements with several of our instruments while we're while we're on the fly and we can and those can also become part of a a very high resolution uh, a higher resolution map than we can generate from orbit certainly of of uh, hydrogen density like in, in prospecting mode. Maybe, maybe you can speak a little bit to, to prospecting mode with, um, with some of the instruments. Yeah, yeah. So what was the question again? I got a little... <laughs> <laughs> it's how, to, how will Viper map the surface of the moon is one of the questions. 
Yeah, I think I think you did a good job. I, I don't know what to add to what <laughs> okay. you already said. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and then we know that um, Piper, you know, during the test, it has already taken its first image, right? Uh, right. On the cameras. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. On the cameras. Uh, on the cameras. And we've taken, um, and cameras are great, but we've also taken um, data with with the spectrometers, mm -hmm. which right. which is um, which for me is really exciting. Ne neutron spectroscopy is kind of kind of really really cool, mm -hmm. and. Um, it, it, you know, so so you know, actually seeing seeing these relatively sensitive instruments operate as part of a whole system mm -hmm. is is actually very exciting for me as an electrical engineer because because right. a lot of times when we build these things, we'll end up with with problems where where one instrument sort of contaminates the data of another or mm -hmm. you know the electronics that 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 are. Re in the computer that are reading the data are, are are stomping on the data that's actually or stomping on the signal that the instrument's trying to measure. Yeah. So yeah, that's impressive. You're right. Like a lot of like uh, like um, NSS and uh, the nervous instrument. So even like with M Solo and nervous, we share some of the field of view of, right. uh, of the cutting. Like when it. Mm -hmm when the trident drill takes the soil, lunar soil out and then it put it. So some of the field of view is shared by both of the instruments. So that's also nice to kind of have a comparison when we have the data there. Yeah. Uh, and like multiple instruments like having, uh, like we do the surface temperature, same the drill does the tem temperature. So like it's nice to add on and like compare with each other and like compare notes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, we also have a question here about how the robot is powered. I know we pointed out the solar panels a little bit earlier. Um, it sounds like some in interest in the um, power source and also the type of battery. Do we know what kind of battery is inside Viper for storing yeah. the solar power? <laughs> yeah, there are two, there are two uh, lithium ion batteries. We call them the, the forward and the aft battery because of where they're, where they're located in, in, the, uh, in the vehicle. And these batteries are, are actually built up out of uh, what we call uh, 18650 cells. So, you know, if you're into lithium ion batteries, you'll know that they're, <laughs> they're sort of the little, sort of uh, uh, triple, bigger than a triple A battery size lithium cells that are prevalent in laptops and in your Tesla mm. and in, in, in a wide range of products. Right. And so we have a group that we work with at JSC, um, led by my good friend uh, uh, Cindy C2 and Angad, and they build these batteries from scratch. They they purchase the cells and they screen them, and they they work with other companies to uh, that that are commercial companies like Eagle Pitcher mm -hmm. to build this to build up these these large batteries and test them. So it, it, you know that that's one of the great things about Viper is that we're, it, it's not just NASA. Mm -hmm. um, it's so we we rely so much on industry and academic institutions to really bring a mission like this, uh, you know, across the finish line. Wow, oh, amazing! And um, you kind of touched on this, Hans, but I know Wendana also. Um, you talked a lot about the instruments. There's this question: Are the, any of the instruments affected by space radiation? I know you guys do a lot of testing. And I'm not. Uh, I, I don't. No, think well, so. they're not really designed to measure space mm -hmm. radiation, or you know, the radiation fields in 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 space. Mm -hmm. um, there there were instruments that were on the uh, the, the, the the last astrobotic mission, the Peregrine mission, mm -hmm. that were more for measuring uh, right. interplanetary radiation. Uh, but we do have to take special design steps to make sure the electronics yeah. are going to work mm -hmm. correctly in in the radiation environment right. on the moon. Um, so we, you know, all of our systems are spec'd in terms of, you know, how much radiation they'll tolerate long term as well as short term. Because you, you know, those are, you, you worry about the long term exposure to radiation because that'll degrade certain materials. But then you also worry about the peak energy, like when you get zapped by a cosmic ray, and how that'll change things. And we have special uh, hardware and software features to kind of deal with this, because it can cause your computers to yeah. uh, malfunction. I saw a lot of the testing that was done on, on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I know we kind of touched on this, this rover is going to go to the lunar south, near the lunar south pole. Um, 
there are a couple of clarifying questions or questions about sort of like what area of the moon is this? We said it's not an area that we've ever been to before. So what do we actually really know about the landing site area and the environment there? So some of the information that we have is from the past orbiter missions. So like uh, especially the landing site, I think it was decided also based on the uh, LRO data. Yeah, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Yes, thank you. <laughs> no Always those acronyms. <laughs> Always acronyms. So yeah, that that that's one of the reasons we decided. And like we were talking earlier when Terry was here, like uh, other reasons to decide was like uh, the terrain. Um, and we want to go to the South Pole. One of the other reasons is also that we want to, the next, the Artemis, the astronauts, they're uh, going, uh, people we are sending, they're going also to the South Pole of the Moon. Right. So this data that when we go there is going to be very valuable asset for them to decide uh, when we look for water, if we find water there, uh, how, when we create the map, uh, how, where it's distributed and how deep it is, that kind of information is important because when we send people, they need water, they need air, oxygen to breathe. So those were the important factors we decided. That's why we want to go there to to help support the next generation of people and like we kind of do their groundwork and then they add on to that. That's basically how science works anyway. Always building because you know we're building <laughs> up from what what we have. Yeah. And then we are looking towards what we want, what we want to know more, because all these orbiter missions, they like detected water, and we are like, okay, we we know there is water, so now we want to actually get down there and uh, look for it, for real. <laughs> we have another question. What would be the three greatest discoveries that you would like to see from this rover? Ah, uh, the first one would be uh, see like water ice, where exactly, <laughs> kind of know how deep it is and speci the dif spatial distribution, and also kind of about all the volatiles, like how they are distributed, and uh, and uh, also even after we find water, we want to be know what's available for use, what, what we can use or convert into rocket fuel, so there is a whole different line of questions that we have to solve after we do the first set, so the first three, yes, the first, the top three. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. The first yeah. Three. there's many. <laughs> yeah, there's many, but looking for water, ice distribution, other minerals, what's more uh, available, like if it's more uh, carbon dioxide, frozen carbon dioxide, or if right, it's more right. ferrous, or what is it? Mm. We want to know and measure, like when we get down there and do it, because so far we have done, we have a lot of data from the orbiter missions that has happened uh, so far, and some of them are still giving us data like uh, LRO, yeah. like it's been operating since 2009. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Wow. So we kind of lean into that and we want to take a next step forward because, okay, fine, we did go to the orbit. Now it's time to land and dig there. And I think digging is also a kind of very cool thing for me. I personally like, you know, going there with a the drill bit and digging the soil yeah. up it's very uh, it's 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 not trivial it's very complicated all the engineering feet and everything to come up and mm -hmm. work uh, perfect in perfect tandem so Absolutely. so yeah yeah and be, really being able to prove that you know to, to kind of amplify that statement about about drilling um, certainly in in the context of, of Martian exploration being right. able to achieve robust uh, planetary drilling starts to become really key as, as we're trying to search for, um, you know, signs of, of biological life, trying to, trying to drill into, mm -hmm. into those layers and really understand the, the, the time capsule that those, um, that that top meter, two meters of soil can really, really uh, provide for us. Um, and how, so, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the soil and, and, and the surface of the moon and what Viper will encounter? Well, so I think drilling, drilling in the permanently shadowed regions is going to present, um, you know, some significant complications. First of all, you're drilling into a very cold surface, yeah. so so it, um, as soon as you bring the drill into contact with with these with these ices that are in the permanently shadowed uh, areas, you, you have a tremendous thermal gradient that you have to design the system to tolerate. Um, as as we can drill into this material, though, um, we can really start to understand the, the inventory of these volatiles. So, 
um, is it a thin layer of ice or, or, or over the period of, of, of uh, cometary impacts or however the water got in place, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how much depth, how much depth is there to, to, this, uh, to this layer? Because right now we just sort of know from orbit that, uh, from, from orbital observations with neutron spectroscopy, we, we know that there's hydrogen down there. Right know for sure that there's hydrogen down there without a doubt but we really don't know the the total inventory and the total state of that so so being able to drill down hopefully we can drill down all the way through it and actually okay. hit hit base soil so that we we get a complete layer maybe we can't maybe we keep drilling and all we keep finding is more and more hydrogen as we as we drill down either result is very exciting yep. in terms of you know the long-term prospects for for not only lunar exploration, but you know, thinking way forward, it, uh, interplanetary journeys. You know, using that using that hydrogen for for fuels. Yep. Well, I know we asked Terry um, and Madonna also already answered, but was there a milestone in the build process that you were most excited about, or that you're still really looking forward to? Um, the probably the um, well the. The, the most gratifying thing for me, to be honest with you, was um, probably when our main electronics box actually showed up from from our vendor. Because right. th this was uh, <laughs> this was this was a, a, a long process, uh, uh, you know, many many years in the making to finally get the, the the brain box that that runs the entire system. And when when the the actual flight computer. Um, you know, showed up in a in a in a in a crate, you know, and we're all kind of sitting there like, wow, that's it. That <laughs> that's like three and a half years of, of of work to get that box into the lab. Um, that that was really gratifying. You know, the second time though was when when we first had all four wheels move. Mm. That was great to see. That was that was a real, real big uh, milestone for the for the program because we had a lot of a lot of things that didn't quite work the way we thought they would work as we're building the system up and we had to come up with workarounds and um, little tricks that we could pull and things like that. But then we eventually got to the point where all four wheels are moving, going up and down. It was great to see. And when you say all four wheels are moving, do you mean the wheel modules? Or the wheel the... modules, okay. yeah. We didn't um, have the wheels bolted on. No, we just, were, we just, were just, wondering. Just the hubs. <laughs> we were wondering what the final piece would be to this build. Like, what's the last like nut or bolt or, or component that gets put on? And Terry mentioned wheels are definitely very close to the end, but he wasn't sure entirely what the last final piece will be. Um, like, I'm excited to see, because I think that'll be a very Yep. Yeah. Very exciting, gratifying moment um, for everyone involved. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I'm interested to know, like, um, what's what do you best like about your job? I know you guys have um, a lot of responsibilities, and it seems you told us a little bit about about what you do. But what is your favorite part of your job? I'm gonna go first. Uh, why, don't you, uh, why don't you go first? Why, why Need a little time to think about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's hard. A lot of things to think. A lot of things um, to think. <laughs> I think there is a lot of, uh, I think the fact that uh, everybody is so dedicated mm. and it's like everybody from also, uh, you know, all over the world are like in my team itself, like people are from even places in Europe like uh, France, Germany and you know, it, they have one big goal mm -hmm. to work on this mission and I feel like uh, it's, I feel like we all are from Earth and <laughs> we have one big purpose to go to a different planet. So I feel like it's a larger than life thing mm. that you work mm. on on a daily basis. Other than that, like, you know, working at NASA, working on these uh, very exciting projects and going to understand the outside. Well, that's another thing, because I've always been interested, you know, to like find the unknown. It always intrigues me, mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, I even like those kind of like, when I was a kid, I used to love these like uh, Sherlock Holmes, that kind of stuff. Mm, because mysteries. you want mystery, it has always, it always takes my interest. 
like more than other stuff. So, but when you're at NASA, you you know that you won't be bored. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's not true. A boring day. It's <laughs> like every everything that you're trying to find. It's like you're trying to see like in my other projects. Like I'm working on Mars uh, mission. Like you're trying to create something which is going to do wind measurement at Mars, or you're trying to measure cloud particles on Saturn. Like uh, these are the kind of instruments we are building in the lab from the scratch. And I feel like uh, this is not every day that everybody gets to do, you know. So that's really exciting to have all this different kind of option and work with everybody who's so talented mm -hmm. here. Everybody is the best. Uh, everybody gives their best, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm also impressed that like people usually fight here for working more. It's not like they don't want to <laughs> do. They want to do more. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's so dedicated in their art, you know, because mm -hmm. they want to get the best out of it and that always inspires me that you have to give your best kind of I don't know if I answered correctly yeah, I think you answered so beautifully that was a really <laughs> great inspiring. answer yeah yeah I, I, I my answer would be pretty similar um, you know I came I came back onto this project about two and a half uh, years ago and um, in 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 my previous job you know we would go out on ships with a bunch of scientists and engineers and would be kind of isolated in this little world with a bunch of incredibly passionate people that uh, were very, very focused on, on getting a, a particular mission accomplished. And, and I, you know, coming back to NASA, it's the same sort of experience except, uh, it, you know, they're, instead of a ship with, uh, you know, tens of people, it's um, agencies and companies with thousands of people and, and to sort of feel that the, the energy in that room, the passion in that room, um, you know, when we bring in people from JPL or JSC or Glenn and everybody's trying to, you know, figure out the, 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 the best way to, to, to solve a problem, it's, uh, it, you know, it's a pretty amazing uh, professional experience to, right. you know, to sort of feel that. and. You know, this, the other thing I love too is, you know, if I have a, a question, you know, like, like, you know, how did the water get on the moon in the first place? You know, I can, I can just walk across the room and I can ask, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah. a bunch of experts, and, and, you know, you can just learn so many amazing things uh, from, from that interaction with, uh, you know, all these different disciplines. And for anyone that wants to be in um, or work at NASA in a mission like Viper, what advice would you give them? <laughs> uh, you know, I would just say it, don't don't be afraid to ask for a role on the mission. Um, I, I started out at NASA as a high school student oh, in wow. in what they call the summer high school apprenticeship research program. I, I don't know if they still have this, but. Um, I was fortunate to work at Goddard, and one night I was working with my mentor, and he was like, hey, come on down, come on down, come on down. <laughs> and he took me into this room where they were building this, this uh, amazing spacecraft called COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer. And I got to meet the PI for that mission, Nobel Prize winning physicist oh, wow. who's sitting there doing the tests on his spacecraft. And, and uh, he was like, oh, come on, sit down, ask me whatever you want to ask. You know, so, uh, it, it, you know, I, and I got into that program just by hearing about it and applying. And then, you know, when I worked there, again, just don't, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, you know, so I, I would just say, get, you know, if you want to work here, there's a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. that's, that's a good one. Uh, for me, I would say to anybody, like, you know, uh, don't let, like, one uh, bad experience or one failure uh, deter you from a big long picture goal because mm. for me I like if something doesn't work my way every day is a new day and it's like reboot restart and like refocus that. so yeah. if you want to get somewhere a uh, first first thing is to f know what you want to do I think that's the big hard part and once you know and if you're not successful at first it's okay uh, you have to just be a uh, consistent and uh, really want it to have it you know, if mm. you really want something, I feel like you get it. Yeah. <laughs> like because you work for it, you know, because yeah. you find a way to get there. And I think that's important to not lose hope and not lose the big picture or vision of where you want to get into life. That's, that's important, I would say. Yeah. 
So how does this mission kind of do that for you? Is this like a career peak? You said you're looking towards Mars after this so, too. So <laughs> yeah, it's it's a person. Yeah, so I started at NASA as a postdoc, mm -hmm. and I was looking at Mars. Uh, I was looking at how dust lifting happens on Mars and how it in the northern hemisphere summer and like how it uh, influences the water cycle on Mars. So that was my first three years, and now if if I look at it with that uh, you know point of view, now I have been working with uh, Viper and Nervous for the last. Like this may will be five years, wow. and then our next step is actually moon to Mars. You know, so I feel like for personally it will be like a full circle because I mm -hmm. started my journey at NASA uh, studying the planet Mars. I'm putting time, and even now, like other than uh, this Viper mission, I also have I work for this flight instrument group here at NASA Ames, so where we have a lot of um, Mars uh, effort going on. So I think once we get in the future, we finally go to moon, for example, mm -hmm. make a moon base, go to launch to Mars, and I'll be, I think, very happy that day. Okay, <laughs> you're looking really long term. <laughs> yeah. I like it. And what about for you, Hans? I mean, rover driver, I think it's pretty hard to top moon rover driver yep. as a job title. <laughs> That's a great job. <laughs> um, I, you know, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know what comes next. Uh, uh, for me professionally, um, you know, I think I think I've I've had a chance to to work at a lot of different levels in organizations. I've had a chance to be more of a manager and more of an engineer, um, and and I think finally I'm, I'm I'm I just turned 55, and I think I finally am starting to know what I want to do with my life, which which is good. Um, <laughs> and and you know, I'm I'm just really fortunate that. I get to build things and uh, uh, tinker with things and, and, and solve really hard problems. So I don't know, fi I'll yeah. find another mission. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know if it'll be in space or uh, in, in conservation work or, or, or something like that. I haven't really, really thought it through. Yeah. Um, it's a hard one. Like I said, it's really hard to know what you want to do, like exactly. It's kind of, it's also changes, I think. I feel like personally, sure. yeah. as you evolve as a person, you, uh, you yeah. sometimes people want to try different things, you know, so. Yeah. For now, it's Moon River. For <laughs> now, it's, it's Viper. Go Viper. Go Viper. <laughs> All right, well, we are nearing the end of our time, but before we go, we do want to let folks know that you can send your name to the moon with Viper by going to www.nasa.gov slash send your name with Viper. Submitting your name there will get you a custom boarding pass for the mission, um, and your name will get engraved on a microchip that's actually going to be integrated on the rover, so it'll be attached to a part of the rover that we've seen here, and it'll fly to the moon with Viper when it launches. The end date for submitting names is March 15th, so hop to it. If your friends and family want to be part of this historic lunar mission, I know I signed up the first day that I could. So. <laughs> <laughs> and to learn more about the Viper mission and get the latest updates, follow at NASA Ames on social media. Thank you to all of our experts. Both of you have been incredible. Terry as well, who was here with us earlier. And thank you everyone who joined us online and submitted questions. And we'll see you next time. Go Viper. Go Viper. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. <laughs>